This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Okay, well, first off, Dan and I met at this contest where we had to give a talk, and Tim Ferriss was giving a talk, Ryan Holiday, Dan Martell, Lewis Howes, me. Mark Echo. Mark Echo, Joey Coleman. Yeah. And then people voted, which it was like a contest. People voted which talk gave the most value, and the winner would get thirty thousand dollars. And I, I, everybody kind of assumed I think that Tim Ferriss was going to win, but Joey Coleman won, and he had a very powerful technique for winning. But I remember your talk was was riveting, and you mentioned some of that story, which was an incredible story in your just out book. I do, um, yeah. That that. Uh... What's crazy, James, is that was the first time I had ever shared that ever in my life was the one you saw. And the yeah, only that reason was, that was, was the first riveting. time. All- like, did you practice it? <laughs> Z- no, zero. I'll tell you the backstory. It was, it was real quick. It was, I was going to do a talk on, uh, I think, integrated life or bal- bol- whatever, balance is bullshit. And uh, J- Jason said to us, I didn't know it was a contest. So what happened is the morning he announced like the best speaker as voted by the audience will win $25,000 to the charity of their choice. My charity is the rehab center that saved my life as a 17 year old. And, and something just told me like, you're just not going to win talking about business and balance. And, uh, I went, I decided I was going to share my story. I went back to the hotel room in the morning, outlined something, scratched it. And then when I came back, check this out, my wife, she's got a big smile and she goes, uh, Hey, my parents wanted to surprise you. They're actually going to be here for your talk. Oh my God. And I was like, uh, my wife had never heard that story. They obviously hadn't. And, uh, I said, can your you wife, just please- wait, wait a second. Your wife had never heard that story. Dude. I didn't tell anybody. Well, don't you think was, okay. We're going to get to this story in a second, but just from a couple's counseling point of view, <laughs> Did you think your wife was going to be upset that you never confided in her? This like dark past you had. Uh, you I was almost too pulled worried. a gun on cops. Yeah, um, not really. I don't know. I guess I didn't because it was such a long time ago, and like there was no part of that that like there was. Yeah, I never thought like you know like if something traumatic happened to her and she never told me. We were engaged at the time. Like she she was pregnant, but we weren't married technically. But. Yeah, no, I wasn't concerned about that. I mean, I was, I was scared, James, like ashamed. I was worried that if I shared that story, that my investors at the time I was working on Clarity and just raised a bunch of money. And I was just worried that literally people would be like, oh, Dan's, a, Dan's an evil person or he's, he should have told us. Like, I was more concerned about my investors feeling that way than my wife. Yeah, because from an investor's point of view, a typical due diligence question is, hey, we did all the due diligence, looks great. Last thing, is there anything we should know? <laughs> and you clearly didn't tell them. No. Because maybe you thought, no. well, but correctly, maybe you thought, okay, they don't really need to know this. I'm a different person now. And and I was 17 at the time. I didn't, I wasn't an adult. I didn't have a criminal record. I'd been sober since. Like, you know, I felt like I had kind of repented. And it was funny because I had this belief that I'll share it once I'm successful enough. And literally my filter was on Oprah or equivalent. It was ridiculous. You know, growing up in Eastern Canada, I was just a stupid kind of like ceiling. Maybe that's why I said it so that I could go through life and never share it. Um, and yeah, I, I owe it to Jason for, you know, setting a scenario in a context that kind of forced me to share it. And when I came off stage, I remember Tim actually pulled me aside. I'd known Tim a couple, probably three years, just because of San Francisco, I was living down the valley. And uh, he said, man, I've known you and I never knew that part of you. As if I share it all the time. Like, see, he thought he just never heard me share it and that I share it all the time. And then I had like seven friends come up to me that knew me really well, like my, like Clay Bear and many others. And same thing. They were like, dude, I didn't know. Why didn't you ever tell me? And I was like, dude, that's the first time I've ever told anybody. And my, well, well, Dan, my we're, in-laws. We're, we're, we're certainly teasing this story quite a bit. So just <laughs> tell tell the story right now. Like it's 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 a riveting story. I'm gonna just let you go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a pretty challenging environment. Um, second oldest of four in my family. My mom was an alcoholic. She grew up adopted and parents, her parents were both alcoholics and they just struggled with a lot of like, you know, they did the best they could with what they knew, but you know, was, there was a lot of like 
trauma and I had, I developed anger issues when I was very young, um, got diagnosed with Ritalin when I was 11 and put on, you know, put on drugs or di diagnosed with ADHD, put on Ritalin. My dad was in sales. So he was literally gone five, six days a week. And, uh, my mom raised us, but you know, like she, she had some real demons that she dealt with and it came out in some pretty unfortunate ways. Was she an alcoholic while she was raising you? I mean, was she an alcoholic? Like, was, when was yeah. she an alcoholic? Our, our whole lives. I only found out my parents got divorced when we were 13. And I found out later, like when I was 16, 17, the reason my dad left her is because she wouldn't quit. And he mm -hmm. like, you know, my, you know, I love my mom. We have a beautiful relationship today, but she all, you know, she sometimes through her, you know, drinking and her mood, she got to a place where, you know, cause we were crazy boys, you know, she had three boys and she raised us like she would throw us in the shower and, you know, to try, like, just water us down to try to calm us down if we were fighting and stuff. Just stuff that to her felt normal because probably what she grew up in, but obviously had a really impact, impact on me. And uh, when I was 14, or no, when I was 12, I got taken out of my house, put into foster, foster care because I just, I had a rage inside of me that was just, I don't know, James, if you've ever gotten so upset where you just see red and it's just this like, this internal scream, but I used to get like that as a 10, 11, 12 year old. And, and what would happen that led to the foster care? Cause usually that's on the parents' side. They want, you know, the authorities want you to go into foster care. It was, it was my parents called the police cause they were worried that I was going to burn the house down while they were sleeping. And when you were 14, well, I was 12. Wow. Like what, why did they think that? Like, what did you say? Cause I would just, I would just, I would say that I would get to the point now later on in life. I, I learned that I did that as a cry for attention because when my dad was traveling in sales and if I acted that way, my mom would have to call him and he would come home. But this came out in therapy years later, but that's what would happen. I would just, I would just get so upset. I just couldn't contain myself. I don't know if you were, maybe other people can't really, I don't know. I just, I would get so upset. It was like, I would hyperventilate and just see red and just like absolutely destroy my room. And like, and, was this, um, was like, like, and this is related to your mom's, you know, being an alcoholic is, is was she bipolar or was she self-medicating in some way? Were you self-medicating in some way? Not at the time. No, no, no self-medication at that age. Uh, my mom definitely probably was with the alcohol. Um, well, a hundred percent was, and, um, yeah, she'd, sometimes she'd physically, you know, punish us in ways that is probably just definitely what you wouldn't get away with today, you know? So, and so, and so you were in foster care. Like what was, I, I, I didn't know this part. What was that like? Like what was, you what know, was I lasted wrong? six months. I went, I went, I, I ended up in a crisis center for a couple of weeks. So they find like a foster parent. Um, which is a pretty traumatizing event, you know, at 12 years old, being taken out of your home and waking up in a, in a, it was a, essentially like a house, but you know, there's four rooms and there's staff 24 seven. Cause you know, I threatened to kill myself in suicidal thoughts. And, um, yeah, the, um, the challenge was that, uh, I got put into foster care and, and my foster, um, dad, I was his first kid. So like I walked all over him. Like it got to a place where, you know, first day we go up to grocery store and he's like, you know, what do you want to eat? And I was like, oh, well, I eat chocolate pop tarts and hot dogs. He's like, that's it. I go, yeah, call my mom. That's all I eat. So he spent $200 on chocolate pop tarts and hot dogs. Like, I mean, it was kind of oh a bad situation. Cause like, I just took advantage of everything. I mean, I get to the, the, you know, he, I, he bought me a pellet gun you know, and that we would go to the range and practice together as like a bonding thing. But then I found out where he used to hide it. And then I blew out all the street lights. And he was like, Hey, do you know why all the street lights are busted on our street? And I'm like, yeah, I think it's this kid up the street, John, like, he's like, that's so weird. You know, like he was just kind of clueless, you know, like these, these, these kind of like adults that, <clears throat> you know, don't, uh, have never done anything bad. They just see the good in everybody. And it got to a point where I ended up, um, we were gone on vacation. We went on a camping trip and I convinced him to buy fireworks for the camping trip. But that night, Wait, has it, has he learned from his experience yet at this point? No, dude. He, and like, I met him years later to apologize because he was just the sweetest person. He didn't ever have another foster kid after me. I, so here's what happened. We went on the camping trip. I told him, I don't want to use the fireworks. He's like, well, why did you make me buy a bunch of Roman candles? 
I did it because I wanted them personally. So when he was, um, when he was gone one Saturday, I actually went in his room and found where he'd hid them. And I started cutting up these Roman candles in his living room. And, uh, I had newspapers out and a, you know, wax candle to reseal. I was, I figured I'll cut off the 25%. He wouldn't know how long they were. And as I'm putting this thing together and there's a pile of like Roman candle dust and like, you know, a steak knife from the kitchen, cutting this open in the candle and the, the whole pile catches fire and it goes off in his house. Like we're talking 4th of July level smoke. And this is like hardwood floor, like super like bookshelves and beautiful furniture. And I run into the kitchen to try to grab like the little white fire extinguisher underneath the sink that he showed me on day one. And like, it does nothing to like try to stop the friggin', you know, blue, green, red, like little friggin' firebombs flying all over the place, putting holes in his furniture. And soon as like kind of things settled down, I, uh, I went and packed up my bags and ran away. And I think I went on the run for about three days. I was 12 at that point. And um, when I came back, the cops found me at my friend's house because, you know, it was like Friday or Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, you know, I told him that Dave said I could sleep over and then they called him and he now knew where I was, called the police because of my foster or the uh, social worker. And they picked me up. And when they brought me back to Dave's place, um, I could hear them talking about me and, he said, you know, he was emotional. He's just like, I can't, I can't deal with this. And oh, he just man. broke down and said, uh, you guys got to take him." So I ended up doing um, a year in a group home with people that were three, four years older than me, criminal records and teaching me stuff. I probably should never been learning at that age, you know, drugs, things with about girls and yeah, life just spiraled out of control. My parents got divorced shortly after that and got turned on to, uh, to different types of drugs, PCP, marijuana. Do you, ever feel, uh, do you ever feel responsibility for your parents getting divorced? I did at the time. I did at the time. It was, it was probably when I was 17 towards the end of my, I did 11 months in rehab that, um, that me and my dad had a really good conversation. That's when he told me about my mom's drinking and how bad it got and what he saw her doing to us and asked of her to stop or he was going to leave. So, but for a long time, that shame and guilt was inside. I mean, I just felt like 100% it was my fault. I think any kid would, even if you didn't experience sure. what I experienced. And so, so you begin this, the book, uh, buying, buying your time, uh, buy yeah. back your time. Uh, you begin the book with this story. I guess you're around 17 in this story. What, what happened? What led to that story? You want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean... What happened was I, um, I ended up in prison when I was 15, got in trouble with the law, drug shoplifting, and I got out and I said I would you know, clean up my act, new group friends, and I lasted a day. Ended up back with the same people. And it was a year later about, um, I uh, ended up just getting such a dark place. I was, I was on the run from the police because I had I'd gotten in trouble uh, for growing weed in my house and I had guns under my bed and my mom called the police and uh, I stole a car and I had a handgun in a backpack and I decided to head to Montreal. My uncle lived there. So I lived in the East coast of Canada and it was about a 12 hour drive. And, you know, I, I was high on pills and drinking while I was driving. And I mean, I was 16. I didn't even have a driver's license. And uh, I took a, you know, an exit on the, off the highway to get some gas. And uh, there was a routine roadblock. And the cops asked me, you know, for my driver's license, I told them I forgot at home. And they said, well, you know, registration for the car. I said, well, it's my mom's car. And when they asked me to pull over, I just stepped on it, just gunned it, took off, got, you know, I think I watched too many action movies growing up because I was like, you know, thinking I could find some area to hide out and run into the woods and, and make my escape. But I told myself before I stole the car that if the police uh, stopped me, I was just going to pull the gun and let them take my life. And what happened was I saw an open garage door in this neighborhood and I came into the driveway carrying way too much speed and just smashed into the side of the kind of the corner of the garage in the house. Let, you know, airbags go off and, you know, it was just like this big noise and I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. So I like hit my head and then I went for the gun. And uh, as I was pulling on kind of the handle, it got stuck between the uh, hand rest and the, the bag. I just kept pulling on it and pulling on it because I wanted to... Uh, 
take my life. I just didn't want to go back to jail and I didn't have any self-worth. I didn't think I was worth a living. And uh, before I knew it, the police opened the door and grabbed me. Like, again, I'm not buckled in. They literally just pulled me out of the car. Didn't even like, I'd say dragged me across the front lawn, floated across the front lawn and threw me in the back of the cop car. And uh, I woke up sober the next morning, wondering what my life was going to look like. And I just remembered having this like feeling that a, I'm alive, and, and the fact that I was alive, maybe somebody was looking out for me. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in a higher power, but something made me kind of think about that. And that was the beginning of an incredibly long road of recovery and um, rebuilding, you know, the, the trust I'd lost with my brothers and my, and, you know, young, like junior high friends and just so many people I'd burned along the way. So I ended up in prison for five months. And when I got released, I got released to a rehab center. Uh, called Portage. And, and were your parents involved in your life at all? Like, were they at... They were, and I'll tell you why. My dad lawyers, told me. Were they negotiating for your My dad told sentence? me... <laughs> it's so crazy. My dad... <sighs> Sorry, man. Um, when I went the first time, they came to visit, and it was so hard on my dad that he said, if you ever come back here again, I'm not, I can't, I'm not coming to visit. I just need you to know that. And... Uh, and he just got super emotional. I'd never see my dad cry. My, my grandparents died when I was like eight. First time I see my dad cry, I'd never again. And he was just super emotional. So like when I went the second time, I kind of knew like I'm here on my own. So didn't come to court, didn't get me help. He, he did what I wish every parent would do is, is just let your child hit rock bottom. You know, and it's so tough. Like that's why I get emotional because I have two boys now. I'm like, I can't even imagine. But... Um, the day I got out, he actually picked me up because he's the one that drove me from the prison. I went to court. They released me to the rehab center. And that was the first time I saw my dad in five months. And, uh, he drove me to this place and dropped me off. And he said, you got to finish. If you don't finish, I'm done. And I did 11 uh, months in this place. And, and where was your mom? My mom was struggling, just trying to survive. Yeah, she was she was in the hometown, but I, I didn't see her. She didn't come. I probably didn't see her for another two months until I got my first visit. The way it works is you got to kind of earn your your passes. It was two months they came to visit. That's what it was. It was like two months, do good. The parents can come visit for like six hours on site. And then you kind of, over months, you look, you get like a day pass and a weekend pass. And But I would still go with my dad because my dad was the kind of like the stable person in the parental relationship. My mom was still dealing with her demons. And, um, but this place literally saved my life. I did all the, figured out what made me tick and, and like the, the feeling management groups and the stories that I was telling myself about my self-worth and my confidence. And, um, and it was at the end of that program, I was helping Rick, the maintenance guy, clean out one of the uh, cabins because it was built on an old church camp. And, uh, in one of the rooms in this cabin, there was this old 486 computer. This is 1997, uh, just sitting there with a yellow book on Java programming, sitting next to it. And I opened the book and I'm like expecting, you know, hieroglyphics and ones and zeros. And it's, it's English, it's Java, you know, JavaScript, if people are more familiar with that today. And I just sat there and I don't know, I just felt like, oh, I'll start this computer up and follow chapter one. And after 20 minutes, I got the computer to print out hello world. And it was just like, Something in me just thought, oh, maybe I'm like so messed up in other parts of my life because I have this gift of like computers or math. I don't know. Like it's kind of, it sounds silly saying it, James, because I'm, I'm not actually that great of a programmer. If you meet these 10X programmers, that wasn't me. But that story of like, maybe that's my thing. And it, and it literally replaced my addiction. And it, and it became the thing I became obsessed about. I mean, dude, I was coding I got out and told, shared it with my dad and he, he really supported it. You know, I had two passions, botany and plants <laughs> and computers. And what? he's like, yeah, I used, I used to grow weed. Yeah, I used to grow weed. I literally, yeah. yeah, my dad goes, you know, you can always have a garden as a passion, but this computer thing you should focus on. And, um, you know, I, I got out and shortly after I discovered this little thing called the internet and it couldn't have been a better timing. And that's, that's been my journey since then, as you know, like I've, you know, I built a bunch of different companies and just built software, just like 
would code till two or three in the morning. I became like almost like a hermit and that I'd meet some friends online and we'd share ideas and build projects together. And, you know, I built my first company when I was 17, 18, uh, that failed, but I just started young and it took a while, man. Well, it took a long well, time. What took a long time? Like succeeding or to figure out business? Yeah, I literally was. This is hard. Idiot, man. I was like, you know, it's funny because in hindsight, I I was I probably my dad had this rule. He said if you read the whole book, so we'd buy like you know HTML in twenty one days or like database design or you know I ended up getting my Microsoft certified solution developer certification, which is like these four huge books that I had to pay 200 bucks to do the test. And if I didn't pass, you only get so many attempts or you don't get it. And I just, I don't know why, again, I became obsessed with it. And, uh, he probably spent three, $4,000 on books and probably a hundred different books. I, the whole computer section at our local, what we call chapters in Canada. Like I just worked through it. CGI, Perl, ASP, like you name it, a cold fusion. A lot of people don't even remember that program in language. It was beautiful. And, um, Pearl, but Pearl I didn't was read him. Language of choice in that year. Yeah, it was, like it was, like a, it was a great one. Ninety-five through ninety-eight, I was like the Pearl years. Yeah, Pearl is Pearl is like the the go-to back then, and um, yeah, I did. Uh, I just read what was, computer what, books. I, I mean, I would say, and and this segues to your your. I, I'm sorry, I always forget titles, but buy back, buy your, back time. your time. Very simple. Yeah, yeah, that's what you tell people to I do. Think it, if I could go back to the nineties and tell myself one thing about business, it would be the stuff you talk about in your book about buying back your time. But we'll, we'll get to that in, in a second. What was literally, you know, holding you back from success? Like you're, you're writing software, nothing yet had been written for the internet. So almost anything you could do was going to make money. Like what was, what was holding back your success? You think, you know, I think I fell in love with programming cause I, I didn't have to talk to anybody. That was the belief I had. You know, you write code, you build something, people go online, whatever. And I didn't understand marketing. I didn't understand teams. I didn't understand buy, buying back your time, any of that. And it wasn't till I was 23 that I finally bought a business book. Like that's what's crazy, James. I, I, bought, I read 100 computer books starting at 17 and it took me six years to finally... The first book I ever bought was called Love is a Killer App by a guy named Tim Sanders. Because I was, I was ADHD. I always told myself I couldn't read storybooks. I'd read like a paragraph and my brain would just go off into the ether, right? Computer books, for whatever reason, because I had like a purpose, I'd read books for things I wanted to build. So it was a lot easier for me because it's like, oh, I want to connect to a database. Okay, well, I need to buy a book on database design and one on some kind of like web, web language. And... Um, yeah, so I just didn't have the fundamentals of understanding marketing, teams, culture. And uh, I didn't even buy a book. I bought an audio CD. That's how little I thought I could even read a book. I bought the CDs on, on break at lunch. I was consulting at the time. And um, I just became obsessed with reading business books. Like it was this clear message. The guy, Tim Sanders, says, you know, super accomplished chief creative officer at Yahoo at the time. So I was obviously, I admired his background and his passion. And here's a guy that obviously wrote a book. So like, I got to listen to him. And he said, uh, you don't even read books for yourself, even though that's important. He said, you should read books for your customers. And that was like, what? Oh, that, like, that's I'm gonna, a really good point. Yeah. And, I, and he goes, if you do that, then you can teach your customers what they should know, but they probably don't have time to learn. And you become the center of, of uh, knowing. And I was like, that makes sense. So I went on this binge. I started with the classics. I started. Like, what do you remember? About... Like, like I would think like that was 25 years ago, roughly. So what do you think you were anything that you remember now, obviously really stood out for you then. What, what's something you remember now that you learned then? Oh, um, the experience economy, just like I, I read that book and it was, it was, they, they just talk about like the customer experience in the journey. So like, to me, that influences the way I create activation flows. I mean, these are nerdy software things, but like, you know, first time user experiences, um, you know, time to first value. Like these are, because today that's, that's what I do. I write software. So it's like understanding how the world works from an experience economy point of view, like with examples in restaurant and hotels, et cetera. And then bringing that to software, I felt like I had these like secrets that nobody knew about. 
I mean, I read everything from uh, Never Eat Alone, Keith Ferrazzi. I mean, we met at an event. Why? Because I said yes and trust in a guy I never met, Jason Gaynard, because I was like investing in relationships. If I go there, I'm going to see some old friends. I'm going to maybe make some new ones. So like, you know, Never Eat Alone had a huge impact on my life that's continued to carry forward. Um, so many. I mean, marketing, just general, like how do you position? Like, what does that mean? How do you... I mean, so many people in software, as you know, James, like they can have the most brilliant idea, but because they can't explain what problem they solve and who they solve it for, they, it just sits, it sits on a virtual shelf. Nobody, nobody signs yeah, up. Yeah, I think it's just all those problems I had. About, this is the hard thing about business. Well, I mean, let's, let, let's look at a, a real world experience. Like tell me about Flowtown. That was like your first business. That was, that was a second company I saw. I sold a company called Spheric Technologies when I was 28. That, that made me my first million. I actually became a millionaire when I was 27 just through that company because we did enterprise portal stuff. Sold that when I was 28 and then moved to San oh, Francisco. Enterprise portal stuff, you mean like you would build like intranets for companies or? 100%. Yeah. Back in the day of like IBM WebSphere, we were helping people migrate off WebSphere. Um, Microsoft SharePoint might have just came out then, but that was my world. Connecting the Fortune 500 to Fortune 5000 companies to their intranets and like their business software. So like SAP, I mean, all this stuff I would never do today, but you know, I cut my teeth. Was it a, like, was it a service company or like an agency? Both. Was we, we started as, yeah, we started as a service business and then we started building these connectors, these things called portlets. And then we uh -huh. ended up kind of migrating to software and that's why we got acquired. Oh, that's great. Who, who acquired you? A company called Function One. They were, they were another service company in the US. I mean, it was single digit millions, not a, not a big exit, but I owned 100% of the company. And that's great. You know, for most people, that was like, like I honestly was like, I'm going to retire. I did it for four years, you know, and that was, was my first all? success. Was this a hard time for you after you sold the company? Like, did you add this money and like, did old temptations come back? I didn't have temptations. I'll tell you what I did go through. I had an identity problem because my whole personal value was tied up in the business. And I remember I negotiated a uh, six month advisory earnout, so like nothing too heavy. And the, mo the day I woke up and realized that nobody cared if I woke up, like it just like, you know, I had to go see a therapist because I was having anxiety attacks. I literally would walk like, and I'm like a mental mindset positivity guy. And here I was having anxiety attacks in my, my body, physical, like chest, like pain, like felt like pressure in my chest. And uh, the therapist, this guy, Manuel, he, he explained to me, he goes, this, you know, like it's not much different, obviously not the same. I don't want to diminish, but it's like losing a child, right? Like you had this you birthed this business. It was who you are. Dan Martell Spheric, you know, we won awards. I, we built this incredible team, like all these things. And then all of a sudden it's gone, right? Like nobody cared if I came to work or not. They, the, the company that bought us took over operations and, you know, they were, you know, they, they, they call me if I needed help, but they were very seasoned. And, um, and that was tough. That was a tough lesson, but no, I never went back. I did start drinking again. Um, which I probably shouldn't have. But I never, never went back to the drug stuff. And, uh, you know, today I'm 10 years sober. Like I quit drinking when my wife told me she was pregnant. So, wow. well, yeah. okay. So Flowtown, what was that about? Yeah. So Flowtown was a product for essentially helping people do social media marketing. Um, you know, the funny story about that is I didn't even want to start it. My co-founder, Ethan, uh, I gave him the technology I'd built with the CTO I had on staff. Essentially, I went to San Francisco on sabbatical and just wanted to learn. But I had a full-time uh, CTO, Scott, that would just write products for me, like create apps for me, essentially write the code. He was a 10X programmer. And um, I built this tool that would give you all the social media data and demographic data on an email address. So like back then, there was a, soft, a company called Rapleaf and other data providers. So we just like put it all together. So you give me a Twitter account or an email address and I would tell you everything else about the person. And that, that was a crazy ride because we ended up, you know, I moved to San Francisco with this vision within a decade, I'd like to build a venture back tech software company and maybe exit it, you know, like coming from Canada at the time, even though I'd exited my company, like I still felt like I had a lot more in me and, um, that, you know, Ethan took the technology and then he was like, we got to ramen profitable. And then he was like, I'm going to raise some money. This is early days of Angelus. So we actually reached out to Naval and uh, Nivi, you know, his co-founder, a lot of people don't know about Nivi, but Nivi was yeah. like, we live next to each other in the mission district in San Francisco. And like, 
I remember our first round, we were having a hard time raising and uh, we called him up and he's like, well, come, come over to the apartment. You know, he's right by Dolores party. He's like, come over and we'll jam on your pitch deck. And we showed him and he's like, so what's the valuation? And this is like 2009, you know, early days, not the current valuation, but we said seven. He's like, he's like, what are you raising? I said, 700 K on 7 million pre. And like, we're 17,000 a month in reoccurring revenue, like nothing. And he's like, how are investors reacting? We're like, uh, yeah, they're not jumping. They kind of say that's cool and they're congratulations, but they, you know, nobody's written a check and we had done like a dozen calls. And he goes, uh, yeah, it's a little, little rich. And he goes, why seven on 700 on 7 million? I said, cause San Francisco, <laughs> this is how ridiculous we were. San Francisco is called the seven by seven city. And we had heard that Mint had raised, I didn't know that. I think 600K, mint.com. Yeah, Mint. Yeah, because there's seven miles by seven miles, it's essentially a square. And uh, Mint had raised 600K at 6 million pre uh, from first round. And we were trying to raise from first round. So, dude, we were so ridiculous. I was 28 at the time, 29, 29. And uh, Ethan was a lot younger. He was 25. And we were just like these uninformed optimist kids running around the valley with our startup idea. But Dude, we got it done. We ended up doing the deal, I think, at 5.5, but we raised close to a million. Um, That's great. And, I mean, look, uh, the fact that you were making revenues showed that people people were raising their hand and willing to spend money on you. Yeah, we were hustlers. I mean, that was the thing that every investor met with us. It's like, you know, I was actually the technical behind the scenes guy. Ethan was the CEO, kind of buying back your time. And, and to that point, like one thing that people should understand is like, I got... Software spoke to a part of me that like the reoccurring model of it. And I think that like the systems thinking I developed architecting software and like growing up in so much chaos, there was something actually like beautiful about code for me, the procedural aspect of it that I knew if I like wrote the code in a certain sequence for the rest of my life, as long as the computer ran, this thing would do its thing. So it was almost like the opposite of the chaos. And then the reoccurring aspect, um, just created this predictability that I just, to this day, like I still only get involved in businesses with a reoccurring business model because I just love the ability to build and be rewarded for a value that somebody can decide to invest in or, or leave on a monthly basis. Like it's just, there's something that well, spoke to me in the, yeah. And this was a fascinating little one page in your book, but towards, I guess, two thirds of the way in where you kind of look at what are your personal, you have this matrix, like what are your personal problems or issues that you've had in the past and how that could be translated into positive skills as an entrepreneur. And I thought that was a fascinating table, but, but okay. So Flowtown, you build it up, I guess you sold it at some point or what happened to that? Yeah, there, there was, there was a shutdown rebuild, like all great entrepreneurial stories for that one. Uh, we had a data issue with Facebook back in their privacy, like the first big privacy thing. Um, but we rebuilt the company, exited that, um, and it was cool because like Ethan made a lot of money and my investors made money, but um, yeah. And then I, I love the next company, uh, Clarity.fm. I was, uh, I, I, I think I might've used it, I, but I, I love the model. You were on there, man. I remember. Cause that's yeah. like, that to yeah. me would have been, yeah, we might, I might've saw you on there. I knew of you. And then, then we met at MMT. Yeah, and, and so this was basically almost like an Uber of knowledge. Like if you had knowledge about something, you could sign up for Clarity.fm and other people could pay for your time and you would meet, Clarity.fm was the mediator in the middle that would connect people and help people discover and do the transactions and, and so on. Yeah, I just had a vision. I was, I was in San Francisco. I just sold Flowtown and I had a bunch of people emailing me and I had this idea where, you know, instead of replying to all these emails, what if they could just call me or like build a queue and then I could just like hit start calls because I was friends with Jeff at Twilio. So I like knew the Twilio API. And I was like, I could just sit there and it could like read to me like, you know, James wants to talk about and then it would read me whatever you wrote and then it would call you. And if you answered, we'd talk. And as soon as I hung up, because like, you know, I, we, I drove a lot. I drove down the valley I, in Canada. You know, it's pretty much all we do because we're geographically challenged. So I just thought it'd be a great way to fill up dead space, you know, waiting for people or whatever, going for a walk, get a workout in and talk to people. And I was on the top of the uh, condo building I was living in. And I remember just looking out at San Francisco thinking like, what if you could like unlock all the friggin' deep technical product expert knowledge in that city for every other 
because I grew up in Eastern Canada where I didn't have access to that network, right? Even if I knew of people, there's no way I was going to be able to talk to them. And that was the mission. I mean, this is like, you know, social media was exploding. I just thought like every person in the world that has a Twitter account could monetize every person that's got an Instagram account, all the influencers, the, you know, the business experts, people on SlideShare. That was actually one of our hacks for how we filled up the expert the, the supply side of Clarity was we built a scraper. First, we had people do it, and then we kind of built software. We called Bonjour, which is French for hello, because it would like scrape SlideShare for experts dynamically, though. James, you'd appreciate this. It like looked at search terms, whatever we didn't have volume or whatever we didn't have results for, but there was volume being built. It would dynamically go to SlideShare, search the search term, find the top experts based on the slides. Go, and then somebody would manually at first go to the end of the presentation, which always has their email and their contact info. And then we would uh, email them saying we had a clarity call request. Do you want to take it? Click the link to accept. They would click it, create their profile. And then we try to reach back out to the person who did the search that we didn't have results set. So it was like that this is really genius. neat. Right, well, that and that's always been my passion is like, you know, what people would call growth hacking. I just call it like, business, you know, like you, that is you great. have a problem to solve and like, how do you, how do you get in front of that demand and how do you fulfill it and how do you scale? I mean, um, how big did that grow? Is it, I don't even know. Is Clarity.fm still around? Still around. Yeah. Yeah. No, the company that bought us was uh startups.com. Will Schroeder, amazing entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, I almost sold to uh Gershman Lehman group who you probably know of in, San, uh, in New York city. This is past my, my non-compete so I can share all this stuff, but, um, essentially, Will said, hey, we won't mess it up. We think it's a really important part of our product stack, what we want to build at startups. And uh, to this day, exists, still grows, which is crazy. Not a lot, but you know, I, he, he shares the numbers. It's like these little single digit percent month over month growth, but it's the beauty of a flywheel. Like once you get it to go, and the way we, we got it to actually continue going was building Clarity Answers, which is like our SEO strategy. So kind of like Quora, we built Quora-like features to create SEO traffic to then, uh, and then the experts could, uh, when they join, we'd ask them if they wanted to do three calls to build their profile. So they do free calls and we dynamically build, like somebody posts a question, the experts would answer it. Then the person would see it. We'd offer them an email to do a free call with an expert and it would just essentially get the flywheel going. And that still exists today. I sold that 2014, so that's eight years ago and it still works, dude. It's crazy. That's like, great. People are still doing clarity calls. And, and the like, code has much, not changed once. How much money does like a clarity person make? Like, like your best performing users, like do they make a living on it? Yeah, we had people making, you know, seven, 8,000 a month. Um, the challenge, as you can imagine, James, is that anybody that starts doing that many calls realizes that there's a business model, either selling packages and or doing courses and or services on the back end. So the hardest part so about making oh, enough money, they migrate to something where they can make more money. They go off. They go off platform. Yeah. So yeah. what we always tried to do is um, have enough uh, supply that was high quality to solve problems. Fifteen hundred was the magic number, and the reason why it was fifteen hundred is because it was enough for a really nice car payment. So we were trying to get somebody to do this instead of their profession, but we needed them to make enough money for them to be responsive to the request. And I learned this. I actually invested in Udemy. I was part, I helped build their growth team there. And uh, we learned that at Udemy. Whereas like at $1,500 wow. a month, it was this like North Star metric where the supply side started showing up and being responsive and, and kind of interacting with your platform where if they weren't making that much, if they were doing like one call every two months, then you'd have a negative experience for the person that's looking for advice, especially if they want to talk to that person. I didn't know you were involved in Udemy. I think that's a great company. Yeah, dude, I invested. I was uh, one of the first investors in their seed round. I exited, oh, probably when they raised their, I think they were about 400 million valuation or something. Um, yeah, Goggin, I actually invested in Goggin, uh, one of the co-founders. I pass on Aaron, his other co-founder did a medical company. That was dumb, should invest it because it's a people thing, right? Like they got me a win. Goggin came around, he did Sprig. You know, I don't know if you saw Sprig, it was an organic food delivery. It was literally Uber Eats for organic meals. 36 million raised. I invested in the seed. Then they raised, you know, 29, 30 million. And uh, in an 18 month period, demonstrated how you can deploy capital at a rate that sounds crazy. But, you know, they ended up giving quite a bit of the capital back. And Goggin's an amazing entrepreneur. He's actually doing another company. It's in my, my lane called Maven. But yeah, 
you know, it's fun because you and I are like in that same cohort of like the tech scene. So we like, you know, we yeah, see like, these like, people kind of like grow. Like I was in Teachable, for instance. I, I wasn't yep. in Udemy, but I was in Teachable, which is another online learning company. But, I, but people on Udemy, like there are some that are doing pretty well, like making millions. Yeah. The, 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 what really worked, I think the Udemy, if you ask them, was when they started creating the subscriptions and, and allowing people to like sell their product for them at discounts. Cause that's always a hard part, right? It's like, you know, if you're selling something that requires somebody's time, like an Uber or even clarity, there's constraints in there and there's different types of marketplaces. You know, I always think about like version one, which is Craigslist version two, which would be more Airbnb. And then version three is more like Uber, right? And, and the rule is it's a three if you set the price. So clarity was a two because we didn't set the price. But if you're going to create a marketplace and you set the price, then then you're kind of like a, a Gen three marketplace. Um, and they're one of the hardest businesses to build. I mean, you're creating, you literally have to solve twice as much problems to make the thing work and you have no control. It's like an organism. You're like, these people have to show up with a need that hopefully we can fulfill and shape and have them behave properly so that don't upset this side. And these people have to be there so that there's supply to deliver on the need because if they come in and there's no supply, they'll never come back for the most part, right? It's like back to that whole activation and first time user experience. But yeah, I cut my teeth. Um, you know, I met Joe and Brian at Airbnb. So like marketplace is kind of one of my strikes, you know, having built clarity, being involved in Udemy. Uh, Travis Kalnick was the first investor in Flowtown. So I like saw Uber from wow. when it was ubertaxi.com at the jam pad. So it's funny watching the HBO TV series because like oh, I haven't seen it I yet. was there. Yeah, like I was in that apartment and I met his girlfriend at the time and and seeing their dynamic and Ryan Graves was my buddy from Chicago. We literally interviewed him for the Flowtown blog. Did you invest in Uber? No, because dude, as you probably, I don't know if you remember this, but when Travis started it, he didn't want to be the CEO. So like, you know how it is. It's like, if I came to you and said, hey man, I got this crazy idea. It's pretty awesome. You know, I've got this other guy that I just found on Twitter, you know, to be the GM. Do you want to put in 500K? You're going to be like, no, because- why aren't you the CEO? And that was everybody's response at the time. This isn't like, this isn't unique to me. This was like a lot of people. I think like Jason Calacanis might have been one of the few people that like knew Travis the way we did and actually said, no, I'm, I believe in this. I'm going to do it. But and Naval also, I think, put in money in. 100%. Yeah. I just yeah. don't know if he actually invested in that the same round as Jason or shortly after when. So what happened was, is there was a period where Ryan came from Chicago. Travis said, move. Never met him before. Met him once and said, okay, I like you brings them to the jam pad and there was an eight month period where uber and we, i remember seeing the charts their gmv gross merchandise value essentially throughput was like it, it was like six million month one 12 million month two 24 million month three it was like i couldn't i didn't i couldn't comprehend a business in three months i mean that's cumulatively 70 million in revenue and if you extrapolate that and this is just san francisco it just was like, duh. So Travis immediately took back over as the CEO and made Ryan COO, which he stayed for a long time. I mean, kudos to Ryan. Him, Molly and Ryan were friends of my wife, Renee and I's. So like, I remember just watching him like grow into the operator that could deal with this craziness. I mean, it was, dude, I didn't see Travis for four years and he was an investor and an advisor. He was actually a formal advisor. We gave him 1% equity to be an advisor. Um, he taught me everything I know about fundraising. That. Travis is world-class. Like he had this blog post he wrote called Raising Skills with a Z, Fundraising Skills with a Z. His, his, his uh, username used to be called Kona T-Bone. That's who he was on, on Twitter, Kona T-Bone. It wasn't, that was his, not Travis Callan, it was Kona T-Bone. And he had a blog post and uh, it was like the most advanced fundraising, like stuff like uh, have your investors text the other investors in this sequence, this message, like very... You know, play your power song in the car before you go in to meet with the investors. He made us, we were listening to Linkin Park and Jay-Z, my, my co-founder Ethan and I, in the car, like that remix. Uh, I think it was, um, I forget what song, but just like, just get pumped up and then go meet with the investors. Like Travis was very serious. And that's why I was not surprised so, to see him just so, absolutely crush the fire. All right. So, me. and this is related to though, you know, buy back your time, which is that, you know, all I, I know so many time. entrepreneurs, yeah, even in the, myself, the, who at yeah. different points got burnt out because all they were doing was 
working on their business and losing their life. And at, at first glance, you don't think that that's so important. You think, okay, well, I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to make money and then I'll have a life. But, but it, they're related. Like you, you don't become truly high performance until you have a life. Also people who are, yeah. who are alive ha have better performance. Well, it's a math problem. So here's what's interesting. I learned quickly because essentially what happened is I went to work, um, it was um, May of the year. It was a Sunday. I went to work in the morning like I did most Sundays to process mail or whatever. I was building Spheric at the time. You know, it was about five months away from my exit, but I was, I was engaged to a, a different lady than Renee, who you met. And um, I came home and I was late. I was like two or three in the afternoon. I was supposed to be back at like 1130 because there was some, you know, this is how little I, birthday, you know, something she wanted me, my fiance at the time to go to. And when I showed up, she was literally in the kitchen just in tears and just um, takes the ring off and drops it on the counter and says, I can't do this. Yeah. And she walks out. And like, you know, like when a woman tells you like, I'm done, I didn't even try. Like there was no like trying to, because this is not the first time we'd had this conversation, but I just thought that's what you do, man. Like I, I worked hundred hours a week for four years because I thought that's what successful people do. And even though I got really good at being productive, like I was, I was incredibly productive. I was, I mean, I would go to my, my, my best friend, Nick would, would tell you today, like Dan would come to my birthday party and sit on his laptop. Like I would sit there in his house. There's a house party going off and I'm on my laptop working on contracts and trying to close deals. Like, cause I thought, well, at least I showed up and he's like, dude, you are the worst friend to be with. And like, that was where this whole buyback your time thing came from. And that's why when I started Flowtown a couple years later, I made Ethan the CEO because I wanted leverage. I had money. And it's, this is where the math problem comes in. At the end of the day, business is about time trades. You know, it's why you have a producer for the podcast. Like you do one thing really well and other people can support you around that. That's why people hire employees. And, and it's not about, oh, I need time. I need me time just so I could enjoy life. It's not about that. It's like focusing on what you're good at makes the business better. And then no matter what you can do to trade the other responsibilities that you're not as good at to, to, to bring in other people or to, to outsource to software or whatever it is, the, the ways you could buy back your time, which you describe uh, so well in your book, these make the business better. It doesn't just make you better. It's not like a selfish thing. No, it's an economic thing. The subtitle of my book is Get Unstuck, Reclaim Your Freedom, and Build Your Empire. I'm not a four-hour work week guy. I want you to build, I want people to fully express who they are. But the problem is, if they don't learn this, they're going to hit the pain line. And entrepreneurs will not grow into pain. James, how many companies have you shut down because you get to a place where I don't like this anymore, right? It's not lighting me up and it's not really making me as much money. And usually at that point, people either decide to stall. I'm not growing anymore. I'm going to go back. Last year was more fun. I was making more money. It may not give me freedom, but at least it doesn't suck. Um, they decide to sabotage, right? And I talk about this in the book, like just the crazy ways entrepreneurs will sabotage their success, or they decide to sell, which I get the call all the time when entrepreneurs think like, all right, this is not what I signed up for. I'm going to sell and I'm going to go do something else. And I, I go, the, the problem you're trying to solve is going to show up in that other business. This is not a unique thing to your industry. You hit a ceiling of how you think of your time and you don't understand there's a completely different model for doing it. And what I discovered a long time ago is you can't build $10 million companies are not built off $10 tasks. And when you audit somebody's calendar, which I teach the time and energy audit in the book, and you just say like, wow, you've got all these things that take energy from you that are $1 sign or $10 tasks, whatever you want to call them. And if you put those in a bucket, you could pay somebody a fraction then your integrator you hired or your operations manager you hired or that friggin' lead developer you hired, you could literally hire somebody else to take care of two or three days worth of work off your calendar, right? And, and actually build a life that gives you energy that makes you more money. Like this is, to me, the buyback principle is this simple. We don't hire people to grow our business. We hire people to buy back our time. It's a calendar, not a capacity thing. The beauty and also, is also, also there's the, the 80, 20 rule, or you even refer to it kind of like as a 95, five, where a lot of things you don't really have to do to maximize your business that you think you had to do, but a lot of things you could just discard that were tasks you thought you had to do. 
they're just beliefs, right? Like we have beliefs that nobody else is going to do this better. I could never hire somebody to do this. Um, if I hire somebody, they're going to, they're going to do it worse. Um, you know, I'm going to train them and they're going to leave. Like there's all these like mental blockers. That's why chapter three, I, I did this thing called the, uh, the five time assassins, right? Cause there's all these like belief sets that people have to overcome to even explore the idea of doing time trades. But like, no, you know, Richard Branson is the billionaire. Every other billionaire wants to be like Oprah, Buffett, et cetera. What they've become world-class at anybody that has an aspiration to build their empire is they're great time traders. They understood the yeah. whole way up. All I'm doing is grabbing work. Sometimes you're hiring a CEO to run a company you own. Sometimes you're hiring an executive assistant to take over your inbox and your calendar. It's still a time trade. And you're trying I mean, to take- Richard Branson owns yeah. 400 companies. Yeah, he, he has 400 CEOs. Co -ce he has two CEOs that runs it. And I spent a week with him. I talk about it in the book. And I watched him spend 90 minutes a day with his assistant having breakfast operate and be available for those 400 companies. And as soon as breakfast is done, he's with us on the ski hill. And that's okay, every so day for him. That's the question I had on that story, which is, I hear about this a lot. Like I've been invited to do things with him as well. Like, and why does he like hang out with other people so much? Because it's actually financially, it's where he gets his deal flow. He's a social person. He's an extrovert, right? He's much like me. I'm an extreme extrovert. I, you know, I love people. I love being around people. And honestly, my life doesn't look that much dissimilar minus, you know, seven houses in different parts of tropical and, you know, exotic places. But I mean, I, I literally wake up every day and just spend time with people that I love and try to be in situations where like, and I, when I say love, I mean like entrepreneurs, business partners, or potential partners I can collaborate with. Right. And like that, to me is I think where people want to get to, right? Like when you ask somebody like, what frustrates you about your business? It's usually well, spending time with people that aren't skilled, not very talented. Well, okay. The only way that you can get to a place where you can afford to hire people that are skilled and talented is by buying back your time to increase the economic engine called your primary business so that it produces enough profit that you can afford to buy back at that level. So a lot of people right. aren't willing to do it because I don't think they trust themselves. I don't think they're worthy of it. I, I think they have- I think people feel guilty too. Yeah, there's guilt. That, that's I coach a lot, not a lot, but I do coach female entrepreneurs, women. And that one is the one I have to work on because there's guilt of their, their mother, right? Like if I hire somebody to clean my house, then my, my mother's gonna think, oh, I can't take care of my family, right? Like this is something that actually happened with my, uh, with my wife where she fought having somebody do meal prep and cooking in our house for a while, like years. And I had to ask her, I was like, why, like, why, why, why can't you, like, we're spending as much money on takeout in restaurants. Like, why can't we do this? And she's like, I just don't want my mom to find out and then think that I can't take care of my house. Hmm. Yeah. And like, people, the problem is too, people count that in terms of this is, this is the basic level. You, 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 they, they trade their, their time for money or they trade their, they trade their, their time for guilt, for, for, to be guilt-free. And that's probably the worst use of time. And, and they say like, I don't have time to go to the gym or I'm too busy to do this, or I haven't seen my friends in forever. It's like, you know, my dad, he had these apartment buildings and he would, he would mow his own lawn. And I'd be like, dad, like you can afford to pay somebody to mow the lawns. And, and he would say, well, I like to do it. And I go, well, if you like to do it so much, why don't you offer the neighbor to do theirs? Well, I don't like to do it that much. <laughs> then you don't like to do it. You just, yeah. there's a belief where you feel guilty. Maybe, maybe you just, there's a, here's a big one, James. People don't trust themselves that if I buy back that time, that I'll be disciplined enough to go work on the thing I know I'm avoiding to bring my business to the next level. That's a big one. Well, that is a big one because they, a lot of people, when they go into entrepreneurship, they have a tough time with structure. And if suddenly you have free time and you're not that good with structure, you're, you're in trouble. That, that to me is like, it's in the, it's in the, the five time assassins, but you know, at the, the way I look at it is even if you just start off as small and like just inbox and calendar with an executive assistant, which is level one out of the five I talk about in my book in the replacement ladder, it'll at least show you there's a different way. And like, even if you're going to like take that time and not be as disciplined as you want, what'll happen is as you pay other people to do stuff for you and your business doesn't grow, it'll force you into looking for a different answer, which then in the book, I talk about investment and how to like invest in new skills. Cause I, 
Like this is time trading works like this is I buy back my time to then invest in either things in my business that makes me more money, writing more code, selling more, whatever it is. There's usually a primary function that makes you more money. And then uh, if I've maxed out that, then it's learn a new skill that makes me more money, right? And maybe that new skill is how to manage my calendar, how to manage my time, how to be more disciplined. Maybe I get my health in check because I'm running out of energy. I don't know what it is, but that's the time trades. Essentially, we like trade money for labor to buy back time out of our calendar, then look at this new free time, and then hopefully, you know, either do more things that make us money and light us up, and, and to, to be able to create more resources to buy back. Because you're essentially trading up the ladder, and the higher you go, the more expensive it gets. But I teach it in a way that I'm going to get you the best ROI for your dollar by using the system I taught. Because what I've seen is too many people try to trade too quickly, right? You see it with uh, people that read uh, uh, Traction by Gina Wickman, right? Everybody reads this book and they are like, I need an integrator. I need to hire somebody. I'm a visionary. They're an integrator. I'm going to pay. I'm going to hire somebody. And they go and spend a hundred grand on hiring somebody to, to essentially run their business. It's like, you don't even have an executive assistant. Like you don't even have somebody that deals with account receivable posting on social media, like basic stuff. And you're going to go spend a hundred grand on somebody that's supposed to like run your company. Like you haven't even learned anything. So it's, it's for me, I just want to, my mission is I want entrepreneurs to create more. I think the world would have more art in it, entrepreneurs in it. Like when I say art, I mean the entrepreneurial output is their craft, their art. If they learn how to buy back their time this way, because they wouldn't hit the pain line. It's mathematically impossible. If you're always buying back your time and you have some level of discipline to learn the new skill set, to monetize higher and, and work on things that light you up, not suck your energy, you're just a different person that comes to work. You describe the difference between, an, uh, and you talk about this in the book, describe the difference between an entrepreneur and an empire builder and how those are different levels of buying time. Yeah. So like my philosophy and why I'm really excited about it, and, it, and it's, the, it's, it's not that it's, it's the opposite of the four hour work week. I think Tim wrote a book for very specific, you know, the new rich, yeah. like, you know, I want to write it for the guy that's at 1.2 million in revenue, a dozen employees and wants to friggin' shoot himself in the foot. Like he just can't deal with the pain. The pressure and noise is too much because he hired and deployed his labor dollars in the wrong sequence. And, and the empire is different because the empire is like, once the primary business gets successful, right? When you're, when you're finally making like north of 5 million a year, decent profit margin, 10 plus, which is very rare in this world, but very doable. If you, like, I truly believe this, available to way more people listening. Um, then you have disposable capital that you then say, well, how can I express myself even more? And that's where the empire side comes. You need to focus on one business. I'm not telling people to do multiple streams of income. I think that's not how it works. Every person that we admire had one business, made millions, and then diversified, right? That's typically the way it works. And, but, but the empire side for me is, what is your unique ability, right? If it's podcasting, then maybe you want to start a podcast network. If it's um, you know, coaching, maybe you want to in, uh, support three or four or seven other coaches, build their own little publishing empires or networks. Or if you're in real estate, you know, like my brother, he, he started off being a home builder. His empire today is his multi-unit construction, but it was leveraged off his primary business. You know, I was building one software company. Now I invest and I have a portfolio of companies that I buy and grow. And that's like my empire. And that will always be. And because it allows me to express my unique ability and it lights me up a hundred percent of my day. And then I buy back all the operational stuff because I built that, but you can't jump there. You have to work your way up learning how to trade your time better. This is leverage. Naval actually, you know, if you think of like output, Output is a byproduct of time, which is constant for all of us. We all have the same amount of time. Multiply times leverage, okay? Naval taught me this back in 2009. There's four types of leverage. Code, content, capital, and what I'm talking about, which is collaboration, which is labor. Okay, so the four Cs. And I got that from my buddy, Alex Hermosi. So, you know, Naval calls it something different. Alex is really good at making them the four Cs. And what happens is if you get really good at leverage, then your output is much bigger, right? So anybody what if, just, has asked, what if you're just starting out though? Let's say someone's listening to this. That's and why you're just start starting out. It's time. It's people. It's labor. And how do you find someone who wants to collaborate with you for for little money? Like they're thinking to themselves, "Oh, well, I have this great idea, and now I need a developer." 
Yeah. Well, you don't hire a developer. You learn to code maybe because you can't afford them. That's the truth. Now you could convince somebody to be a co-founder and that's a different, you know, right. uh, problem solve. But I'm, t I'm talking to like Rick that owns the bike shop. I'm talking in my right. book. I, I, I wanted to build this for middle America entrepreneurs that own the HVAC companies and like, because those are, that's, those are my friends. Those are the people I grew up with. My best friend, Nick owns a sign shop. My brother's a home builder. You know, my other friend, Mark, like these are local businesses and they're the worst culprits, right? Because they have all this pressure around social norms and like the idea of somebody coming in their house and cooking them meals is so foreign. They live in a small town of 200,000 people. Everybody would know. Who are you? Are you a prince? You know, are yeah. you... Like it sounds crazy, but but, where, you know. and, and, but they don't realize it's not particularly if you're trading. Time it's economically the activities. only way right. to grow. Like there's a this certain was the point biggest, where you're founders' capacity. I mean, this was the biggest. I was a, a programmer from the beginning, and this was the biggest realization for me when I realized with my very first business, oh, I don't have to do all the programming. I could relax a little and pay someone. The program. But wait, don't you do the programming? You're 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 the one who does the program. No, no, no. I could just manage this process, and my life, my not you only did my life become a lot better, but the business became a lot better because maybe I wasn't the best coder, or maybe it was better for me to relax sometimes so I could re-energize. Yeah, or your skill is best deployed in marketing. Maybe like, and this is the thing. It's like yeah. if you are a better salesperson than programmer, that's true for me. Like I love to code, but truth is, I wasn't a 10x programmer then I'm better off filling up my calendar with prospecting and sales calls than writing code because that'll turn into a higher economic output, leverage, than just sitting down and trading time for money. And that is the big idea behind the buyback principle. Well, look, it's a, it's, it's a great book and um, you have a lot of kind of buyback rules, tips, suggestions, the, the buyback rules that you have. You have so many different mental models for, for imagining, you know, how to trade your time for, for money, for business, for opportunity. Uh, it's really like uh, uh, a book I wish I had, particularly when I, I started. I Man, I could have – this. I do have – people say, oh, I don't have any regrets. I do have regrets. I feel like I could have made a lot more money on my first business if I knew the techniques, for instance, in your, in your book. Like I did not manage – my time properly at all. So I couldn't build the business to the level I think it could have been built. And, and I, it was a good sale, although I lost the money later, but uh, I could have done a lot better. I just didn't, just didn't have a clue. And your book has lots of clues and solutions. And I really, uh, I really think it's going to be a useful book for a, a, a lot of entrepreneurs. And it's, it's buy back your time by Dan Martell. Dan, what, what's exciting you right now, actually? What's, I think you have your, uh, well, your SAS Academy. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Buybackyourtime.com is the URL of the book. I'm like, heads down, I'm going to push this for the next three years. It's like my life's mission to help entrepreneurs get free and avoid the pain line. Um, and then I'm still coaching. I have the largest coaching company for B2B SaaS CEOs. We have a thousand coaching clients and pr really proud and honored for the impact we get to have there. And, and a lot of the book was an extraction of having to help my clients free up their time to be able to execute the stuff that actually has the business impact. Um, and then I work with at-risk youth. I mean, my story is, is, and what's crazy is even when you first saw me tell that story, um, up to that point for 15 years, I three, four times a year, I went back to the place. It was a big, it was a big part of my life I, I was shameful of and I didn't tell anybody. Like I would go back to Portage and speak to the kids three times a year and I wouldn't even tell my wife I was going. That's how wow. kind of like ashamed That's I was. Incredible. It's it's nutty, and, and I share did, that how publicly. Did your, Go ahead. How, so I'm sorry. How did your wife and and her parents react to your talk? Like was it was that the first time your wife heard this story? It was when you gave the talk on stage. Yep. Um, how did she react when you got off the stage? Was she like, "What the hell"? It was relief. You'd have to ask her, but I, from what I remember, her saying to me was, "I now she get in the you. house. I'm gonna bring her on the camera right now." No, she's not here. <laughs> I, I would bring her on in a heartbeat. She's, she's an incredible woman. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a relief of like, she understood me now. I think people know me and they're like, why is he so intense? And why is he so driven? Why is he so obsessed? I mean, the truth is, it's just like, I just got a second chance at life. That's just true, man. Like I wake up every day the re and you'll see in the book when I talk about the buyback lifestyle, which I think is really exciting that you probably resonate hardcore with today. Like my business yes buy back but what about the personal 
What about like looking at opportunities to not do anything other than spend time with people you love and uh, work on really creative you know, projects that, that leverage unique talent. That's, that's what I'm excited about. It's like, how do you live the Richard Branson life when you don't have a billion dollars in net worth? Right. And, and that's accessible to a lot of people that just don't even know because they, they got to overcome the belief. The thing to close, like to, to close the loop on when I told the story, it was my in-laws and that was the most powerful thing. Cause at the, up until that point, I think they struggled with understanding me. Cause like, you know, Renee's husband or fiance and he's, he's different and the way he, he works is like, cause they grew up, one was a teacher and the other one was like an employee at it. So like, they didn't have that context for what does it mean to be a business person and take risk? You know, and I asked her, their daughter to move to San Francisco and like, that was crazy. And so it was, it was beautiful. Her mom like got emotional and gave me a big hug. And wow. You know, ever since then, you know, I, I just, and that's, I was and there. That's, well, dude, and this is why I share it every time I get a chance now is because the relationships I build when I go first and I'm vulnerable and I'm, and I own that. And, and to say it didn't come with its downside would be lying. Like there were some challenges I had to deal with in regards to going across the border, James. Like I almost got kicked out of the U S cause I had a, as I created a crime. And when you fill out the form, it asks you, did you ever create a crime? And I said, no, wasn't true. They saw the video on YouTube when it blew up, it got picked up by gold cast. And so there's been some challenges, but far, far, far beyond that was just the, amount of people, kids, parents have been able to serve through that story that, you know, in hindsight, you know, like you say, we don't have any regrets, but yeah, I probably should have shared it a lot sooner than I did. Well, my, my wife just ran in. If you want to ask her, Renee. Yeah. Where's Renee? <laughs> Come here. Um, James Altucher. Remember when I got up on stage and I shared my story for the first time at MMT and you didn't really know the details. He wants to know what it was like. Here's. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Renee, hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. And Dan was just telling me that was the first time. First off, I can't believe I was there the first time he shares the story. Second, he said that was the first time you heard that story, which I didn't know this until now. How did you, when he's on the stage telling the story, what were you thinking? You're you're pregnant I'm with his child. You are not married yet. What what were you thinking? I'm not only pregnant with our second child, wasn't it? That was Max. It could have been Noah. Yeah, no, we've. I was pregnant yeah, with our second. Parents were there helping out with Max. Yeah, and my parents were there, and I just kept looking over at my dad, thinking, "Oh my god, <laughs> what, what I get myself thinking? into." <laughs> what were you? Thinking? Were you yeah, about? okay. Like, and then when he got off the stage, were you like, were you, were you a little upset that he hadn't confided in you all this stuff before? No, I no, I I, I understood why because I think that it was a gift that he was able to share it in that moment with those people in that room. But no, I feel like there was also a part of it where he didn't, he was worried. He was worried what I would think or worried that I would leave. But in fact, it actually just made me more proud of the person that he became. But I was like, damn, I didn't, I didn't know you did all that. I mean, did you get, did you, you better tell me everything now. <laughs> Is At this point, else? I'm like, yeah, what else are you hiding? Come on, cough it She's up. Got it all <laughs> now I know the story. <laughs> well, congratulations to you both. How many kids overall right now do you have? Two. Two. So that, was, got a puppy, that was so number two. Like a <laughs> you were like, this guy's crazy. I'm not having any more kids with him. We're going to stop here. <laughs> yeah, but it was a point of no return. I looked at him. I'm like, smart. Good, good play there, buddy. Now I get it. He <laughs> locked me in. And that's the story. Had to but, lock it down first before I disclosed. Right, exactly. You had to make sure. <laughs> well, it was a great. I mean, I was at the edge of my seat while you were giving your talk. It was a great. It was a great talk, and I was happy to meet both of you guys at at that very first, you know, mastermind talks, which is a great conference. And now, how many people go to that during the years? Like thousands. Yeah, I was actually at the one. Well, obviously, COVID had an impact. Um, Renee's got to go. Thanks, babe. All right. <laughs> nice to see you, Renee. Good to talk to you. Thank you for answering um, my question. Yeah, no, uh, I think the last event, there was like 200 and change. I mean, it's, you know, J uh, Jason does a good job of curating, keeping it, uh, you know, to the number that you can go to an event and feel connected. But I've probably been to seven since then. And it's just, honestly, when I look back, I actually moved two years ago, Renee and I and the kids, we moved from the East Coast to the West Coast into the mountains. 
And a big part of that was the friendships and community I made at MMT. Like seven of our friends that moved from different parts of the world and cities, we all decided to move to this one place called Kelowna, BC. And we're raising our kids together. Todd Herman's there, uh, Daryl Hicks, uh, a bunch of, yeah. Wow, Nick Todd Herman's there. Because I, I last saw Todd in his apartment in New York City. Yeah, yeah. he moved. He came from New York. A bunch of guys came from Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. And, and we're, we're doing life together. It's, it's beautiful. Well, Dan, it was so great uh, uh, hearing the update on the podcast and talking about your book. It's a really great book. I highly recommend it. I wish I could recommend it to myself in the 90s. And thanks once again for, for sharing your story. And look, maybe I'll run into you at a, an MM, MMT. Jason just wrote me recently. I've got to respond. I'm, so, uh, I'm really bad at responding to emails, and I feel really bad about it. That's you need somebody thing. else doing that for you. Ch chapter maybe. six. Yeah, Jay, Jay's listening. Maybe Jay could do it, but he doesn't. He doesn't write like me though. So it's all good. I um, uh, yeah. And honestly, if anybody's listening, I don't know if I should say this. Go, go to the website, but just ask me. I'll send you my executive assistant framework, my email inbox GPS strategy. So if Jay does do it for you, James, um, at least he'll do it in a way that makes you not go crazy. All right, I'll 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 I'll, I'll send you that email. So so buybackyourtime.com is your yep. website. Buy Back Your Time is the book, and Dan Martell is the name. And thank you so much, Dan. It's an honor. Appreciate you, James.